Welcome to Steam Powered, where I have conversations with women in Steam to learn a little bit about what they do and who they are. I'm your host, Michelle Ong. My guest today is Jessen Tanady. Jessen is a developer advocate at Facebook who creates content about Facebook's technologies so that people outside of Facebook can use them. Join us as we talk about Jessen's past life in augmented and virtual reality, tech communities and democratization, and reflecting on attending women's educational institutions. Welcome, Justin, to Steam Powered. I'm so happy to have you on speaking to me today about all the stuff you're doing in tech and all the cool things that you want to talk about today. Thanks for having me, Michelle. So you doubled majored in computer science at Media Arts and Sciences, which is a great double major. But what prompted you to do that? Um, so I, wow, I feel like the story goes like way back. Uh, I attended a liberal arts college when I was, um, when I was an undergrad, um, it was called Wellesley College, um, and that gave me a lot of flexibility to go explore a bunch of things. So I was trying to figure out what I wanted to major in, and I almost accidentally fell into these two majors. I think um, yeah. when I retell the story, the way this happened was like, I came in as a chemistry major. I took it for a semester, oh. realized that I hated chemistry, um, went to my professor's office, just kind of like crying. I was kind of like, I'm just, uh, I cannot see myself doing this for the rest of my life. Like, this is terrible. Um, and he was like, okay, like, calm down. You are 17. You still have your whole, like, you're still allowed to change your mind about this. Um, and he was like, all right, for one semester, just take classes that you've never taken before but have always wanted to take um and if nothing sticks you can always come back to chemistry but you know it's like just like explore something for a semester um so i took it took his advice um just started signing up for random classes i took an intro to women and gender studies course i think i didn't know what that was before taking it um and i took this thing called um intuitive programming i was kind of like I don't really know what to expect, but I think computers are the future. So like whatever I learned in this class, probably going to be helpful. Um, so I took that for, I, I took that just kind of like on a whim, learned to code um, and kind of just like fell in love with the problem solving aspect of it. It's kind of like, oh, whereas in chemistry, I was kind of learning about the periodic table and like, activation energy, like all these things were theoretical with code. It's like, I can learn things like print things or just like apply my knowledge immediately and then like see it see things happen right in front of me and that was so addicting to me um yeah it's so tangible that's what i love about yeah, that yeah exactly like that feeling when you like that hello world moment when you like hit like print hello world and it actually shows up and you're like oh there it is you know it's like that is yep. and it's like you like add an exclamation mark and it changes and you're kind of like oh my goodness <laughs> like this is a real thing sorry about my dog um, okay. Like, oh my goodness, this is a real thing. Um, so I, that's kind of how I like fell into computer science. Um, separately, I attended my first hackathon that semester. And um, if you're not familiar with the hackathon, it's kind of like a weekend long competition where you kind of like learn things, build things, and then share things with other people. Um, and I remember at my first hackathon, my team created a web app. Um, and I'm sure it was something like very silly and like very simple, but it's like, for the first time in my life, I was kind of like, wait, like all those like cool applications that people build, like I can use this stuff that I'm learning in class to like make real applications that can like very tangibly like affect the um, affect the people around me and affect the communities that I like care about. And that was just like very, um, that was very enticing to me. So that's the story of how I became a computer science major. The story of how I became a media arts and sciences major was that uh, <laughs> I really enjoyed drawing. I enjoy illustrating just kind of like as a hobby um and this media arts and sciences major what it allowed me to do was kind of like it's very it's a little bit experimental but it's kind of like you have to do something at the intersection of tech and design and i know that sounds really cliche yeah. nowadays but it's kind of like um you can kind of do anything you want with it so i had like peers who were working on like museum um art pieces you know like when you go to like a children's museum and you can like touch things and hold things to like learn yeah. about like the water cycle or whatever it's like there were people who like got really into that. Um, I know there are a bunch of like music tech people who came out of my major, um, but what I was really interested in um, coming in was making video games because um, I enjoy <laughs> cool. video games and I was kind of like, oh, cool. Like I enjoy like the design part of it and I can also like program it. Um, so kind of put that together, but it kind of like tailspin into um, me getting really into like computer graphics and augmented reality and virtual reality um, and just, 
like again it's like it was so addicting to be able to like code something and design something and then like yeah. give a set to someone and have them like experience it right there in front of you um and like really just be able to react to this thing that you built um so that's kind of the story behind my two majors that is awesome i love that combination i love the fact that you know, you even the fact that media arts and sciences existed just to be able to create that blend for people to be able to say you know there is actually an intersection here that's yeah. very very cool yeah. yeah, I remember when I was like um, choosing the school that I wanted to go to, like I wasn't even thinking about this major. I was like looking at like at the time, like, I don't know, I was in high school, but it's like I was really into like school rankings and like what is the average SAT score and like just like <laughs> what is the distribution of like you know where, where do people get like internships out of the school um but one of the most like valuable things that and i ended up getting out of the school was like the ability to take this major that i wasn't even thinking of going into yeah. it um and i just like i cannot imagine my life and career had i gone to a different school yeah definitely and the fact that you had so much flexibility to make that change. I mean, yeah. I can't imagine having the flexibility to do that kind of thing in the Australian system. Personally, I don't oh. know how much has changed since then, but you kind of just, you pick your thing and then you kind of roll with it, but you've already chosen your school. You've chosen your field. Uh -huh. um, so if you wanted to switch, I don't, yeah, I'm not quite sure how hard or easy it would be. I was going to ask like, what does it look like if you suddenly decide that it's like, wait, I do not want to do this anymore. Like, do you just have to reapply? Like, yeah, I'm not it? quite sure if to reapply, but you, you, you basically have to bug out of that degree and start okay. a different one. You might be able to get exemptions for stuff that you've already completed, but I can't see it as being as flexible as the kind of change that you made. And I've speaking to someone else as well, who had a similar um, experience. They went into political sciences and then into physics and it's such a big difference. I can't see how this system here would support that kind of switch with that level of flexibility. Mm. Um, but again, it's been a while since I've been in the system, but yeah, I couldn't imagine like if I decided I didn't want to do comp sci anymore, how I would switch that. <laughs> I guess yeah. just out of curiosity, how did you get into comp sci? Like, how did you know as a teenager with so much conviction that this is what you wanted to do? And like, you're right. Cause you're still doing this so many years later, but it's like, how did you figure that out for yourself? Yeah, so ooh, when I was in high school, um, uh, we were offered an information processing uh, class for, okay, uh, we have tertiary entrance exams to get into university. And so you have to do a certain number of subjects in a certain number of areas to be able to get the scores allocated for that. Um, you can pretty much do whatever subjects you want, but um, they might be prerequisites for the course. So with the comp information processing one, it wasn't exactly a prerequisite, but it did contribute to my science part of the scoring. Um, and I like computers. Computers seemed interesting. Um, my brother is much older than I am. And so we've always had a computer in the house because, you know, this is at the time in the nineties where you only ever had one computer per household. Um, <laughs> so we've always had computers in the house and I liked what it did. I thought it was kind of cool. And it was like played games cause that's what you do. Um, but we were shown, you know, programming at high school and I just went, this is kind of cool. I can kind of make things do stuff. And that's very neat. The history was also actually quite interesting to me because they covered a bit of that to, you know, give us an understanding oh. of where computers came from. Yeah. You know, I just went, well, I don't know what else I want to do at the time. It was like, oh, I want to be a journalist. I want to be a lawyer. You know, the kind of high school thing where you kind of switch according to whims and what you're watching on TV at the time. Um, uh -huh. and you know, the computers just come kind of stuck for me and you know, I, I didn't want to do anything like law or med for real because it was hard. I didn't like blood, you know, all this kind of stuff that kind of goes, well, it's not really for me. And I needed to choose a degree that would get me a paying job. Tech was up and coming. So yeah, that's kind of where I went with that. And yeah, even though like, interestingly, we didn't cover a lot of like web tech when I went through, um, uh -huh. we did like one unit in Perl programming, but everything else was like in C and compiled stuff. And I somehow found my way into web and went, nah, this is far more interesting because web is instant gratification tech. <laughs> <laughs> 
um, <laughs> like because you build stuff, you don't have to really wait for it. It just happens. Like this is it. This is great. Like I, I build it. I see it happen, and uh -huh. I get joy. This is fantastic. Um, and it just kept going. And web tech keeps changing and keeps growing. We keep doing more stuff with it, and I just had no reason to kind of leave it and go, yeah, somewhere else. So that's me. I love that you went through this whole like process of elimination, which is like, I don't know what I want, but I know what I don't want. And yeah. you ended up here, and this is, I, I love that. It yeah. makes me Thank you. Like, think a lot of, um, and I have younger cousins who are like starting university and they are kind of like, oh my gosh, like I need to know what I, I have to know what I like need to major in. Like I have to like have my entire life planned out. And it's kind of like, there is so much that is going to change in your life. And like, there is. I didn't figure this out for myself until so much later. And it's just kind of like, I don't know, just, I, I feel like I was that teenager as well. You know, it's like, I've kind of felt like yeah. I have to have everything figured out, but it's like, you just like learn these things about yourself and like slowly become more aligned with um, what you were meant to do, I guess. Exactly. And, you know, in parts, I do feel that <clears throat> like I had to choose a path just because of the way the system worked here. I felt I had to pick mm -hmm. something and stick with it. Like I had to have conviction for it. And that did make things a lot harder because there were things that I wanted to do more. Like, cause like I, my family has an artistic kind of streak going through it. And so I liked art. I like doing that kind of thing, but art doesn't make money. Right. Um, cause it's what the parents tell you. So, you know, I, I, I went to the sciences cause that's where the jobs would be. And, you know, if I had the flexibility or if I knew that I had the flexibility to be able to combine the two, I absolutely would have. And that's part of the thing. Like you don't know what's available to you. So you make the choices based on what you think, you know, uh -huh. and so many people I've spoken to, they've just taken the opportunity to try other things even if it's not part of the immediate course they'll take you know other you know to join other clubs or participate in other activities and you know just branch out and do kind of that and broaden their focus which is amazing and that's absolutely mm -hmm. what everyone should do because you don't know like you said you don't know what your path is you don't know where you're headed mm -hmm. and it's just yeah hearing from everyone saying that you just need to give everything a go and yeah that's amazing yeah i really love that you brought up um like how finding a job that would pay the bills was a big factor in like why you chose to go into computer science. I feel like something I hear a lot is kind of like, oh, like, you know, it's like, you have to do, like, if you're going to be in this industry, you have to be passionate about it. But it's like, hey, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a high paying industry. Like a lot of people are in it for the money and that is a perfectly yeah. valid reason to like do this, you know, it's, or just like visa reasons. Like, um, yeah. Actually, I don't know if you noticed, but like in the United States, like um, if you're a student and you want to stay after your undergrad, you get one you get one year to stay if you are not doing a STEM yeah. thing, but you get three years to stay if you're doing a STEM thing. So I have a lot of friends who oh, are wow. doing computer science kind of as a double major for the visa. You know, it's kind of like, all right, this gives yeah. me more time to figure things out. And I'm just like, that's a great reason to do this. Like, you don't have to be passionate yeah. about this. Like, you know, I just like... I feel like it's like the passion thing is like not necessary, but like, it's nice to have, right? Yeah. Cause well, you can be passionate about a lot of things and mm -hmm. you know, but realistically things are sometimes a means to an end and that's mm -hmm. completely valid and completely practical. And yeah. you never know what something, something you're going to do when you do it for that reason, is it going to mean something else to you later on? Mm. So, you know, Wait, it's all that. okay. <laughs> 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 so. Where did you see yourself <laughs> doing, you know, oh. your comp site and your double major? Like, what did you think you were going to do with that afterwards? Wow. I don't think anyone <laughs> ever asked me that. And I'm trying to, like, mentally put myself in a place where I was, like, right for graduation. I, um, yeah. for a long time, I thought I wanted to make video games. Um, I was kind of like, I am a consumer of video games. I love playing video games. Um, and I feel like I would enjoy making video games for a living. It's just like, um, I don't know, it's like interest wise, like these are kind of like at the inter intersection of a few different things that I enjoy. Um, I attended um, game conferences for a while. So I was at like game yeah. developer conference. Um, and um, I think the first year I went, I went as part of a scholarship um, from this thing called the Xbox game changers um so basically every year xbox sponsors like i think 30 women to go attend this conference that would have otherwise been unaffordable 
to me because like tickets yeah. are so expensive. Um, and I was so glad that I got to go. I got to meet like so many cool people. Just like kind of, I don't know. It's like I was a student and I was kind of like, oh, wait, wait, like this is like I'm at the conference. Um, yeah. And also just like having a cohort of just like other early career people who were like trying to figure out if they wanted to be in games as well was also like really exciting to me. Um, nice. So I thought I wanted to make video games for a while and then kind of accidentally fell in love with AR VR and like research. Cool. Uh, so I was um, kind of like, all right, like video games, there's a lot, there's like a big overlap between like the skills that you learn for like making video games um, and skills you learn for making like augmented reality, virtual reality stuff. Uh, so yeah. one summer I was in Korea working at a, interning at a startup called Reality Reflection um, and they made VR games at the time. I think they created one of the games that um, released with the original Oculus, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, wow. 2016. Um, but another thing that they worked on was uh, photogrammetry. So if you're not familiar with that, it's basically the art and science of extracting 3D data from 2D images. Um, so the way I like uh, to yep. describe it to people is like, if I took a photo of my face from like this angle, and then I took another photo of my face from this angle, and I like throw these photos at like a pile of machine learning, it can basically figure out like, oh, this pixel from this photo and this pixel from this photo are the same point in 3D space. And we can yeah. like 3D cloud meshes out of that. Um, so I was like, wow, that is really cool. I didn't know that was possible, but it's like, that makes so much sense. And kind of, I guess, back to your point about like instant gratification, I love being able to like <laughs> try it out and then like automatically like see that this is real. Um, so I got really into the concept. I got really into like, colors and like figuring out like how um you know like what kind of code you could write to make um to describe the way light bounces off surfaces so it's like if something is very specular like if, if something is very like shiny or if something looks very diffused or like if um i have purple hair so it's like when light comes in like and it bounces out it's like purple it's like what is going on um and how would you code that up um to make that look photorealistic um so yeah. i don't that and there's like a huge academic field around the computer graphics about that actually um i don't know when this is going to be released but um it is currently uh the 9th of august 2021 and yeah. uh Sky graph is happening right now um it's yes. like a really big yes okay like computer graphics conference and they're remote which is like super convenient but um yeah <laughs> computer graphics that is a thing that's out there um but i yeah so there's like a huge academic space in terms like for people who are like interested in like this kind of stuff and i was like wow i love this um and that's how i actually <laughs> fell into research question mark um so <laughs> uh, i was kind of like oh cool like that's this so is cool. really awesome like how can i do more of this uh so i started um kind of looking for research opportunities yeah um, up uh, working as like an undergrad research assistant person at the MIT Media Lab. Um, so nice. I was working on a project where um, I guess they were working on a lot of like robotics and it was kind of like, how can we, um, the way I usually describe this to people is kind of like, how can we map uh, virtual objects, like objects in like virtual environments into like physical environments so imagine if like um i don't know you're in vr and there's like a virtual like turtle in front of you if you like touch the squishy part of the turtles like um tortoise i don't know it's like the squishy part of this thing <laughs> yeah what if you could like feel something squishy underneath you and if you touch like the hard shell what if you felt something that like kind of like resistant yeah, get the so it's feedback. Like, yeah 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 so it's kind of like um there were a bunch of like robots that were being built at the time with like a bunch of like pins that could in, in, like independently move up and down and like kind of simulate um i guess like pressure um so i did that nice. for a really short bit it was a really cool project but um i felt like uh I did not know anything about robotics. And that was <laughs> me. Um, so I ended up uh, joining another lab that uh, I didn't know this at the time, but um, they were in the aero astro department at MIT and they, um, I ended up like making augmented reality navigation tools for astronauts. And it's like something nice. that I did not expect going in like at all, but it's just kind of like, wow, this is really cool. Cause like, the, basically like the premise of like this project was like all right like theoretically we one day want astronauts on sur the surface of mars or like let's say the moon um and i didn't notice before i joined this project but apparently we used, we used to send people to the moon with paper maps and we've had people like struggle to like triangulate themselves on the surface of the moon just because like they're very sparse landmarks so it's like hard to like figure out where you are yeah um 
and like people have gotten on like extravehicular activities so just like moonwalks i guess and like had that last like 30 minutes longer than they were anticipating which <laughs> like i'm like just like think about like the oxygen it's like oh my gosh like every minute is like so crucial yes. and so important but also like we don't know he doesn't know where he is on like on the surface of the moon. i know so um basically that's kind of what it worked on like it was kind of like oh like what if we use augmented reality um technology to help astronauts navigate and just like um get like relevant information so it's kind of like just like what would a display look like um like what would that look like um from prototype um and ended up like testing it um in on, on a lava terrain so basically it's just like miles and miles of just lava and it kind of looks like um <laughs> like a different planet and we kind of like tested this out with like a bunch of like prototypes and had people like walk around and try to like find things um and that's cool that's um so that's what i thought i was gonna be doing i guess like when i graduated <laughs> kind of like ties back to your original question just like what did i think i was gonna be doing with this major um came in just kind of like hey this is really cool um and it left yeah being like wow there's a lot of like really awesome research and just like um cool applications of just like the intersection of like tech and design so yeah that's nice yeah. but you kept doing a lot more vr stuff afterwards didn't you yeah so um i ended up joining a startup called uh control labs and what they worked on was um neural interfaces and what that is is Ooh. like um, you know when you like move your hands um these are like electrical signals that are being sent through your nervous system, right? Um, and it turns out, um, and I didn't notice before joining the company, but it turns out that um, you can get these uh, things called electromyography sensors to so EMG sensors on the surface of your skin. And it can pick up yep. these kind of uh, signals, which means that like it can figure out like, oh, the kind of signals it takes when you do a fist versus when you um, do like a really light fist or like a, any kind of gesture basically yeah. um, can be recorded. Uh, so if you kind of like i guess like collect data from a lot of like a wide variety of people doing like similar poses you can kind of like extrapolate like oh um you know like based on these signals what is the person likely doing with their hands um and it turns out you can use that as a controller or just like input for computers um which i think is really cool um i was excited about like the vr and video game applications of it so it's kind of like imagine yeah. like video games where you don't have to Pork your hand around like a specific like joystick or like your mouse or whatever it's kind of like you can map any kind of gesture to any other yeah. kind of gesture and that just has like huge application just like from a like game design perspective but also just like as you're designing virtual environments like thinking of the way we can interact with virtual environments there's just like so much out there um so yeah. i did that and i thought that was really cool and um facebook thought it was cool as well so they acquired the company and <laughs> Working at Facebook, um, cool. I love developer communities. So I ended up, um, I'm now a developer advocate at Facebook. Nice. That is awesome. So what do you do as a developer advocate? Hmm. So um, when I think about uh, what I usually, okay, the way I explain this to my family is um, Facebook hired a bunch of software engineers to talk to people in developer communities about mm -hmm. how Facebook technology, so like the kind of technologies that like Facebook has already invested a lot of like resources into building, um, how that can be useful for external developers use cases. Um, and through conversations with external developers um, about like limitations and just like use cases and um, like the kind of things they're struggling with or like seeing what people are like building with these kind of technologies, I can take these kind of like anecdotes and like bits of data um, and bring it back internally to help drive better products um, for developer communities. So it's kind of like a big cycle of just like, help me help That's you. That's very cool. Nice. That is very cool. Yeah, because um, I, yeah, I couldn't tell when I was looking at the title whether it was an internal or an external position. Like, you know, you see a lot of people, you know, the advocacy stuff doing external work, talking to the communities and doing stuff like that. But yeah, so this is definitely bridging all of that together to be able yeah. to kind of, yeah, that's awesome. That is a very, very cool thing. So do you still do that work as well as software engineering work at the same time? Or is this um, what you the do all day now? The is my full time now. I actually, yeah. uh, it's kind of weird. I started off, I, I got hired at the startup as a software engineer. Um, yeah. And at some point I ran developer communities there. Um, I think 
my official title at one point was product manager and then the Facebook acquisition <laughs> happened and I became a technical program manager. And I remember <laughs> telling them, like, what is that? And they're like, go find out. Um, so I was like, all right. Um, so I did that for about a year before I ended up like realizing like, oh, I want to work with developer communities again. So I am now a developer advocate full-time. That is very, very cool. <laughs> That's awesome. So as part of the developer advocacy stuff, um, I mean, you've mentioned also that you're very interested in open source and democratizing tech. So is that the kind of work that you also incorporate into this position? Yeah. So I guess like one thing that really attracted me to this job, or I guess like one thing that I kind of keep in the back of my head as I'm kind of like navigating the world and my career and like what I want to put out into the world is just like thinking about like where I am right now and how I got here and how I feel very um, privileged in a lot of ways to like have ended up here. Like I yeah. feel fortunate that I was able to go to the United States. I feel fortunate that I was able to go to college um, and I learned to code through college and I met a lot of incredible people through the tech spaces that I've been a part of. Um, and now I'm fortunate enough to be in a position where I feel like the stuff that I build gets seen by people all around the world, which is so wild to me. Um, yeah. But just kind of like working backwards from that, it's kind of like what happened that made it, it's just like there, I, I just feel like there's so many things that had to like fall into place for me to have ended up here. Um, and I often think about alternate universe me where like if any of these variables had not played out the way they played out like had my parents not like whatever like had my grandparents not moved to the capital city had my parents not whatever you know it's kind of like there are so many things that I feel like could have gone differently um so I feel very privileged in that sense and I think a lot about like well I think that I would like alternate universe me who may not have necessarily had all these privileges to have the option to have the life that I have. Um, and in my head, I'm just kind of like, if I can, I'm like, I'm, I work at Facebook right now, but it's kind of like, if I can use my platform and like where I am right now to make tech accessible to people who, to the version of me where like life did not play out exactly this way um what would that look like um so for me yeah. i think a lot about like oh like um just like beginner friendly resources i think a lot about like um having tech documentation available in multiple languages or that are not just english or just like any of like the few languages that dominate the web um actually something i was thinking about recently was how yeah um, there are like Okay, like I speak Indonesian and I speak English and I speak terrible Mandarin, um, but it's like Google Translate for all intents and purposes are like generally okay for that. Like English to Mandarin, it's kind of like, it can kind of like figure out like whatever I plug in, it's like it can figure out, there, there are enough like English to Mandarin and then Mandarin to English like resources that like Google Translate does its job pretty sufficiently. Um, There's so many languages yeah. out there and so many dialects where it's like these kind of resources don't exist. Um, exist. <laughs> That just means that if you don't speak English or French or Mandarin or like German or one of the languages that like dominate the web or Spanish, you know, it's kind of like, I often think of the internet as a democratizing force, but it's like, there are all these things that are not accessible to barriers. People. Yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. Um, and this kind of came up because, um, I learned about this project within Facebook, um, that recently got open source. Um, it's called, uh, I believe it's called Flora's Facebook Go Resol Resource Go Resource Language. They do like kind of like benchmarking for um, languages, and I thought that was really cool, and ended up making a video about it um, on the Facebook Open Source channel because I was just kind of like, nice. "Wow, this is it's really cool that someone that like Facebook just kind of like gave a bunch of researchers a bunch of money to like go figure out how to do this." I'm like, they're doing this because like it would be beneficial for the Facebook platform, but just like as someone who like is multilingual, it's kind of like, yeah, there's so much information on the internet that's just like not accessible because you don't speak a certain language. Um, yeah. So I think a lot about, um, yeah, just like the documentation, just like tech resources in different languages as well. Um, yeah, how can we get information? How can we make that accessible to, oh, to a lot of people? Another thing that I feel like really yeah. drives me is um, I attended this talk a few years ago, um, and I feel like you might 
find this interesting, but it was from uh, one of the people who worked on Scratch, I think. Um, so it's like this uh, visual programming language so it's kind of like what if you get like lego blocks and you can like put them together yeah. and create like for loops or conditionals or whatever um without having to write the code like all of these blocks like have code um but it's like you're just kind of like putting blocks together yeah um, the idea is like oh you can oh sorry wait this sorry, i'm thinking of mit app inventors similar concept ish um what if you create apps using like lego blocks so that this is something that's accessible to like kids or it's like it's really easy to like create um apps uh, without having to like dive into like learning a programming language. Uh, and I attended a talk by one of the people who was MIT app inventor and he talked about a workshop series and I wish I could remember this guy's name, but he talked about a workshop series where he did, where he like taught kids how to use MIT app inventor. And what I, what really, I'm like, I listened to this talk a few years ago, but it just stuck with me for so many years because instead of doing that thing where he's kind of like, all right, kids, we're going to learn about for loops and kind of like go through <laughs> little skills. What he did was he started the workshop asking the kids to like brainstorm a thing in their life that they would like to fix using an app. So it's kind of like these kids were like, you know, it's like, what is a problem that you are like the community that you are intimately yeah. familiar with? Um, and how can you solve that using an app? So um, I don't remember any specific examples, but like it was kind of like in a ballpark of like, oh, my grandma has trouble getting up the stairs and it would be really cool if she had a button that can alert me when she needs help climbing the stairs or whatever. Um, yeah. And just kind of like starting the workshop thinking about like, okay, how can I- Real like, applications. My community, yeah. And then diving into like, all right, what does MIT ha Inv App Inventor have to offer? And in the end of it, like building the app. And what I thought was really cool was that like the success criteria at the end of it wasn't like a quiz that was kind of like, what is the output if you print this or whatever? It was kind of like, it was the kind of questions that were like, um, what extent do you like identify as a person who can solve problems in your community? And I thought that was really cool. It's just like, the concept of just like testing whether someone not testing but just like checking whether someone like identifies as someone who can make change because i feel like there's a, such a difference between like oh i'm a person who knows how to write code versus being a say like i am a programmer um i think yeah. about this in the context of just like women in stem i guess or just like you could be a woman who knows how to write code but feel like you don't belong and it's like such a change when it's like you start to self-identify as like uh, no i am a programmer it's like i am a person who like can make these things and i thought that was just so cool um and i think it about that a, it, lot, like, in the context of my yeah. work <laughs> yeah it's an absolutely like it's an empowering kind of way of thinking about things and it's great that the example was you know this is a problem you'd like to solve do you think you're a kind of person who can solve it and it's like oh because now it's a, it's about something that I have to think about. It's something that I have the power to affect change for, and yeah, it, it's such a switch in mindset because a lot of people don't realize that they can affect change and that they can you know do things that make a difference, and that's uh -huh. very cool. I <laughs> attended a women's college for undergrad, or like a historical women's women's college. So basically, um, like the majority of my classmates were women. Um, and I don't know if I would be in tech had I not gone to that school because I feel like when I was in a classroom of like predominantly women and like my like computer science classes, I wasn't like mm. one of the three girls in the computer science class. I was just one of the many computer science majors. And it's like I it was so freeing and so liberating to be able to have um, to kind of like have that. Um, there's an XKCD comic where, um, it's kind of like, man does maths bad, and the comment is like, oh, you suck at maths, but girl does maths, the same math things bad, like, badly, and the comment is like, oh, girls suck at maths, and I yeah. love that I, like, through this, like, environment, I had the space to fail, like, not feel, like, it was so high stakes for me to succeed or fail, like, I could just, like, yeah, I had the freedom to like fail. I had like that safety net because I wasn't like, oh, girl in computer science class. I was just like one of the many other computer science students. And I feel yeah. like that really helped me identify as someone who could be in tech and someone who um, I'm like, I'm here today. And yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had a similar experience because I went to an all girls school. 
Oh, really? So, yeah. Oh, I didn't know so that. I yeah, so all girls school and there were there were six people in that computing class I told you that I took. So only six. And because the class was so small, they actually had to um, combine our cohort with one or two other schools in order to have enough people to do <laughs> proper assessments. Uh -huh. So yeah, it I it never occurred to me that, you know, getting into tech and getting into these fields, it would be a problem because they just went, well, you guys just want to do this. We're going to teach you how to do it. And because everyone was kind of in the same boat, in the same goals, it never occurred to me that this was a thing that wouldn't be possible. Yeah. And yeah, and that 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 is a privilege because I can't imagine being in an environment where other people have had that issue, where they've had that comparison between what the boys can do and what the girls can do. So yeah, definitely, you know, it's an interesting kind of reflection on the uh -huh. opportunities that we had. Yeah. Did you ever um, like have people question like, oh, well, if you're too comfortable here, then how will you adjust to the real world where there are men? I don't remember that being a mention, but I do remember like socially <laughs> um, <laughs> there were, cause you know, because it was an all girls school, occasionally we'd have socials where they get you know, the boys school and the girls school, <laughs> you know, have social events. And it is a thing that did come up from time. It's like, well, if you don't associate with boys, how are you going to deal with boys and with men in the workplace? <laughs> and it's like, well, kind of just have to deal with it. Right. Like I, I but again, privilege, because if you haven't had the issues, you don't know that there are issues to be had. Mm. And yeah, so it never really occurred. And then when we got to uni and it was like, we knew to expect that there were going to be more guys and girls doing our course. Uh -huh. Um, I, yeah, they never actually had, like, I never had the experience where I felt that I was seen differently because I was female. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I also don't know whether that was again, privilege because despite having a cohort of 250 with about a dozen girls, I, I didn't personally notice, but I'm also yeah. oblivious. <laughs> So like, it's a bit 50, 50, like maybe I didn't notice because I wasn't looking or maybe I didn't notice because it didn't affect me directly. Um, but yeah, those, those are things I do think about when I hear about all the other stories from people who have had those issues. I like the way you articulated that. It's like you had the space to not think about these things or not have to notice these things. And you could yeah. just like exist and focus on yourself without having all this pressure. I love the way you phrase that. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, how about you? How did you have, you know, how did you feel coming from, you know, primarily female environment for yeah. learning and then going to a co-educational one afterwards for, uh, you know, a tech field? I feel like I would not have identified as a developer had I not gone to a predominantly women, like, uh, and uh, had I not, like, studied computer science in, like, a historically women's college. I, and I feel like that's just so important. Like, it's kind of like, had I gone to a co-ed school and had I like, I don't even know if I would have like stuck with computer science, but it's like, had I stuck with computer science, where would my theme be? Or it's like, to what extent would I have been able to like identify as a developer? Um, yeah. I, and it's hard to know because it's like, there's no way to like replay my life um, and change yeah. variables, but it's like, I don't imagine that I would have been confident in my abilities um yeah. going out there in the world um and I feel like even even though I felt very like confident in, like my identity as like a developer I feel like there were still a lot of moments I think like working where I kind of like second guess myself or I question like wait like am I capable enough to do this am I like you know it's like am I am I wrong I'm just kind of like not really giving myself like the benefit of the doubt and just kind of like being like oh my gosh like ah um yeah and I imagine that would have been so much worse had I not had my baseline been a lot lower in terms of like <laughs> um yeah so I I guess to answer your question like I think that I would have had moments of just like oh my gosh like why is my code so bad or whatever like in the workplace but the fact that I felt more confident about like my ability to code or just like yeah just like purely from like a confidence standpoint like I feel like it it's good that I had gone to a historically women's college. 
I don't know if that makes sense. It just kind of like yeah. went around in circles. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's the kind of thing that is difficult to reflect on because you don't have that other comparison. You don't have mm-hmm. a way to be able to gauge what you would have done in the alternate situation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you know, I, I have imposter syndrome. It's terrible. Like it's, it's, it's a really noisy voice, but, um, you know, I, my imposter syndrome isn't about, I'm not as good as the other guys. It's just, I'm not as good. So it's, I'm an equal opportunity imposter syndrome person. Um, (laughs) but yeah, it's, yeah, it's an interesting thing to reflect on just to think about the way that you would have developed in terms of your confidence, had you not been in a more supportive environment. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Deep thoughts. Things to reflect Deep on. Thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> interesting. I, feel, I graduated several years ago, but I feel like sometimes I like go into conversations with people then it just like helps me like reframe or rethink my college experience. And yeah, I don't know. I kind of like, sometimes I like think about like, oh, if I had a time machine and I could have gone back to like high school, me trying to figure out like where to go to school. It's like, could I articulate all of this and be like, hey, what you're going to experience and what you're going to get out of it if you go to this school, like, would that have mattered to high school me? It's like, is that something that, like, high school, like, the concept of, like, identifying as a developer, is this something that, like, high school me even cared about, you know, or, like, yeah, in a supportive environment? It's like, I don't even know that that was, like, a thing that was even on my radar or, like, something that I even, like, considered. Exactly. Um, I mean, it, yeah, of course, you think more about things more simply back then. And I mean, considering the fact that um, I was in high school 10 years before you and we're still having the same sorts of processes, like they talk about how, you know, things have changed, but things haven't. <laughs> mm-hmm. So we're still going through those same sorts of thoughts and those same sorts of things. And yeah, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> I'm kind of curious, like, this is a, um, so you, you started this podcast series. Um, it's called steam powered, which I think is really just like a really good pun. Why? Yeah. I like puns. <laughs> I love puns. I like, okay. Like I know like puns get such a bad rep, but it's just like, I, <laughs> when you're learning a new language, puns are the easiest way to be funny. Yes. And I like have relied on that so much when I've been in environments where it's like, this is not my primary langu- language. I just like say stuff and like say all these like dad jokes and people groan, but it's just like, this is all I have. Please read <laughs> <laughs> oh. That is completely relatable. <laughs> oh, steam powered. Um, <laughs> why? Um, I guess like, why I, I, um, I love that. Like you, um, you made this like a steam focused podcast instead of a stem focused podcast like what um i we talked a little bit about like your um web dev background like what 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 is Mm. what is the a that you do what is the art that you do okay so uh, um i the women in my family have a bit of an artistic streak so i do like art i do like making things and being creative and doing things with my hands um so my non-work is a but in my work, there's also the A in, you know, the fact that, you know, I am making websites, I am making applications. I might not be a graphic designer, but I still have to think about UI. I still have to think about the way that people will be interacting with, you know, the thing that I'm building. So it's about accessibility. It's about um, the way people think about how they approach stuff. So there's your psychology there. There's, um, you know, for some of the things I've had to do, you have to to think about the ethics and the morals of what you're doing, what you're building, like nothing like massively serious, but you have to think about, you know, the impact that you have on the work that you do. And all of this is A, and all of this is, you know, the liberal arts in terms of psychology, in terms of, you know, yeah, you know, architecture, literal design combined with, you know, engineering. It's, yeah, that's why the A is important to me and that's why the it's about STEAM because what we do, like what you're doing, developer advocacy, it's about the communication. It's about creating that connection between communities who are very tech oriented, trying to create that bridge between tech and people. So mm-hmm. A is all through that. Wow. I feel like that's the um, <laughs> most like wide definition I've heard of A. I feel like I most often hear like, oh, it's about like art and design. And I love that you pulled in like ethics and just like communication, just like all these different, um, I guess like not soft skills, but it's just like creative things that also come into like 
the process of developing tech. I yeah, guess it, it, it's a broad definition, yeah. <laughs> but it, it's, it is pervasive in the work that we do every uh -huh. day and we just take it for granted. Yeah. I guess like something that I've been thinking about recently is like, what, like, what would tech look like if we didn't think about, if there weren't people thinking about like ethics in tech, um, yeah. and should more software engineers, like, should it be like a requirement in a computer science major? Should more like engineers like be thinking about ethics? Cause it's like, I know when I was in school, it's like, we learned how to code and we learned about like, uh, about like assembly language and like logic gates, but it's like at no point were we like uh, for, for the major specifically, like it wasn't like necessarily part of the major to think about like tech ethics. And I kind of wish that I had a dedicated yeah. course for that. Um, and it's I, really I did, important. Like, yeah. yeah. Is that something that you had when you were in school or like, is it something that you started um, thinking about afterwards? So sort of in, um, I did an honors for my computer science, um, and it was in psychometrics. So there was psychology and A there, but part of the honors course was, uh, uh yeah, part of the honors course was, um, a unit called the, um, where we covered the philosophy of science. So. You know, we, we did talk about, you know, what science is, the way that we do science, what it actually means for science to be science, the experimentation, inductive reasoning, all that kind of stuff, which is where you think. Um, and also, I've, you know, I've spoken with games people where it's like the ethics of games, the content that you create, the storylines, the way that you get people to interact, the way they get people to engage with the story. And, you know, you, you, you see the whole thing where, I'm going to do bad things in games because I can, but a lot of people don't. A lot of people still be nice in games because like, but you know why you've got that, um, kind of barrier for, I'm not going to be a complete jerk, uh -huh. even though it's a virtual environment. Um, so it's thinking about the way that people will approach games in that way as well. And the way that it reflects their own behaviors. And then you look at how a lot of science came from defense. So you got the yes. ethics there. Uh -huh. I mean, that's the biggest example right there, right? You know, building science for bombs, building science for weaponry and the way that a lot of that tech is also repurposed for research purposes in science in other places. So, um, I was talking to someone recently where, you know, you have military tech for, um, uh, sonar for submarines, but they're using it to find whales. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all this stuff that we have, a lot of it comes from an area where we do have to think about the ethics of what we're building and um, the impact that it has on society in a lot of different ways. So yeah, it's, it's stuff that you kind of think about kind of peripherally. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I was actually like semi recently in a conversation with people about that, about just like the history of just like, I guess like the very, like the role that like military plays and like the history of tech, um, both from just yeah. like the tech, development perspective you know, it's kind of like like you said like yeah. sonar or just like gps or just like oh um you know it's like how did we f why why did we invent this and you like look back for you pe you peel back enough layers and it's kind of like oh it's because we're making bombs um <laughs> um like not only just the technology but also just like the funding and just like where did the money come from yes. and it's kind of like why like even if um even if like specific tech companies or startups today do not take money from military it's the ben they're they benefit from I, I think of this as kind of like the ancestor companies that like kind of laid the way that i benefited from funding from military and it's kind of like that's yeah it's like all silicon valley just kind of like that's such a i don't know interesting thing to think about yeah well the ecosystems all feed into each other right because mm -hmm. you know it's the again the ethics all science can be used for good and evil so it's how you apply it yeah. and you know it's you know there's so there was a i was reading just recently it was about deep fakes the tech for deep fakes uh -huh. and you know you can use that for a lot of good because you know you see being able to replicate imagery there's efficiency in that there is um that uh, you can use it for personal purposes for you know being able to connect with your dead family members, for example. Mm -hmm. So you can use that to create more realistic videos if you need to 
kind of connect with family or for genealogical purposes, for historical purposes, you could make more realistic museum kind of exhibits by being able to use deep fakes to simulate, oh. you know, George Washington talking, you know, that kind of stuff, all the cool educational stuff. But then again, you've got it for the malicious purposes, mm -hmm. your porn deep fakes, your, you know, pretending to be officials kind of thing. Yeah. But yeah, the text there is just how you use it and uh -huh. thinking about what you're going to do with it. But yeah, <laughs> militarizing versus, yeah, democratizing the tech. <laughs> That makes me think a little bit of just like, um, I don't know, I guess like back to the whole like, oh, uh, should tech people, should individual like people working in tech think a lot about like ethics or is that just going to like stop tech progress? Like, it's not, it what, we'll never stop tech progress though. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're always going to get people who, you know, you think about what you're going to do. People are going to do it anyway. And whether they do it for the money or for, you know, the greater good for the, you know, for the science you know, it's always going to progress, but it's also being aware of what you do. Because there are going to be people who go, oh, my stuff can be used for evil. I'm not going to do it anymore. That That's that's fair. It's a valid kind of choice. But thinking about the impact of your work is not going to limit your work. It's what I think anyway. Thinking about the impact of your work is not going to limit your work. <laughs> <laughs> It's fit for thought anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm just like, whoa, it's like, this is like, con this is like something that I didn't expect I would be like thinking about at, uh, it yeah. is 10, 11 p.m. <laughs> no. New York City. I'm just kind of like, wow, it's like, this is probably the deepest conversation I've had at 10 p.m. this week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Didn't think we we're going to head this way, but still cool. <laughs> yeah. So, um, one of the people I spoke to before, um, uh -huh. Her name's Pauline, and she does games, and she, they they teach about ethics in games and morals in games, and you know they have a lecture as part of the or had it was a different um, university, but they talk about this. They talk about um, I'll have to link it. It's a thing called Scandal in Academia, and it's about um, ethics in academia, and you know the way that people approach, the way they think about things, and it's a lot more involved than that. And I don't want to I won't do it justice by mentioning it now but I'll kind of link that um but yeah it it is important in tech and in science well any of these fields to have these conversations about you know what our work does and what our work means to other people and yeah again spoke to nuclear scientist and she's she talks about the way that nuclear science impacts society and, you know, the way that you know, we do need to think about what we do and why we're doing it. So you look at you know, nuclear science, people think of the bomb, but they don't think about the medicine, the chemo, you know, all of that as well, the radiotherapy. Mm -hmm. It's all of that tech is there and it's just how you're going to use it. I'm, I, I, I really want to, I'm really excited to go like check that out after this. Yeah. <laughs> Get some sleep first. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that went off on a massive segue. Was there anything specific that you want to talk about with the open source? Because we're talking more about the democratization of tech. Ooh. Being able to have everyone to have access to, yeah, be able to contribute. Yeah, it's kind of like the technology that's being used to build all sorts of cool things is accessible to literally anyone in the world and the fact that like anyone can contribute to it that's that's pretty freaking cool <laughs> it is and you know the fact that you know it's not just the techs who are contributing to it as well i mean open source it's there's so many aspects to that as well and you get a lot of people who are not in the tech space contributing to open source in their own way mm -hmm. and yeah because what this stuff touches affects so many other parts of society as well. So everyone needs to get involved. Yeah. I, um, there's this, uh, thing that happens every October called Hacktoberfest, uh, which is, yep. are you familiar with that? No, I'm not. Oh, okay. Tell it's me. basically a big effort to like encourage people to go contribute to open source. Um, and I remember the first time I like looked into it, I was extremely overwhelmed by like, oh, like, oh my gosh, like I am new to this. It's like, what can I contribute that 
all these other people who are more familiar with the code base haven't already contributed. Um, and it turns out that like um, people who are like more familiar with the code base will like very well like, scope out like tasks that I could do. And then like, it's kind of like, oh, oh cool. like, it's a very easy way to like plug and play. But like another way that I didn't realize I could plug in was language translation. Cause like what happens Ooh, a lot is like, yes. oh, like someone like starts this open source project and it's like, it grows and grows and grows. And it's kind of like, they probably speak one language and maybe someone else like volunteers yeah. their time to like translate it to like Spanish or whatever. But it's kind of like, what, like, if you are a multilingual, you can literally just like contribute by like translating documentation because that's probably like, very low effort for you. But like, it means a lot for the person who's like maintaining this. Yes, like, who are maintaining absolutely. This. Like, you're not exactly writing code code, but it's like, it's a very real and tangible way you can contribute to open source. I think that's cool. Yes, absolutely. Actually makes me wish that I was actually fluent in the languages that I have a passing kind of experience Ooh. with. <laughs> languages are those? Oh gosh. So my family's Hokkien. Oh, okay. So I, yeah, I understand Hokkien, but I can't speak it very well. I, uh -huh. It sounds awful. Um, uh, I, after I did computer science, I did Asian studies as another undergrad, um, doubling, double majoring in Japanese and Mandarin. And that's also not very <laughs> anymore. <laughs> Lack of use. Um, oh. yeah. And also My, like smatterings um, of stuff here and there. It, it's yeah. Nothing terribly useful. <laughs> it's like four languages though, right? That you can kind of. Four languages really badly. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that I spoke Hokkien. My dad speaks Hokkien. My grandparents on that side speak Hokkien. And it's like, I don't cool. even understand. And I really oh. wish like, I don't know when you're like, oh, you understand, but you don't speak. I was kind of like, man, I wish I could understand. But yeah. Side but project. you speak Mandarin with them, right? Uh, badly. Very, very badly. badly. <laughs> Home level <laughs> Mando. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That is the problem about, you know, growing up in a Western country or predominantly English speaking country and yeah. all your language skills kind of go down the tube. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I've been in conversations with like people who are having kids and it's like, they have to think about like what language they want their kids because it's like, mm -hmm. oh, um, like, I don't know. It's like, if they're, if this kid's growing up in the United States, they're most definitely going to pick up English from school. So it's like, how can you make sure that this kid is also fluent in like Spanish or Mandarin or whatever the home language is. And it's kind of yeah. like, right, we have to like make a very like focused effort to like only speak Mandarin and like around this kid at yeah. home. And it's just like, that's like, wow. It's like so much effort to like keeping culture alive, but it's like, it's so important. It is. And a lot of my friends are in multilingual households and, you know, even my husband's Cantonese, my, my family's Hokkien. And we both speak really bad Cantonese and really bad Hokkien. So it's not like we can easily pass it on to our daughter. So we you know we try to get the family to speak in front of her. So she gets used to hearing it, but uh -huh. she's not going to be immersed in it to be able to learn a lot of it, which I find a little bit of a shame, but I know, you know, have friends who have, um, Japanese, uh, at least, at least one Japanese parent and they only speak Japanese to the child and the kid is multilingual just straight out of the gate. Um, but yeah, having to be able to, you know, try to pass the language on, it's really hard. And we know that, you know, Mandarin's not going to be hard. You can learn Mandarin everywhere. Cantonese, you can get classes, less common, but still, still doable. Hokkien though, nothing like, and because there's like three, there's three varieties of Hokkien at least. And being able to find one in your regional dialect or regional variant of Hokkien is even worse, like it just doesn't exist. So yeah, different wow. sort of problem for me. <laughs> I did not know that there were three different varieties of Hokkien. I cannot yeah. believe I am this... not learning this from my dad or my grandparents. <laughs> I'm learning this from you in my <laughs> <laughs> oh, But um, I think there's at least three, but um, it's, yeah, it's, um, I didn't really know that there were that many varieties of Hokkien to be honest, until I started watching Taiwanese dramas. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I was watching Taiwanese dramas and I went, I, un I, I hear the words, I understand a lot of it, but there's some words that I don't follow. And that's when I realized that the variants were different. 
And oh. I was also talking to my other friends because we're from Malaysia, but my friends are from Penang and their Hokkien is different as well. So there's a bit of overlap, but there's some words that they use that we don't. And it's like, oh, okay, this is interesting and problematic. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. Wait, what? Can you recommend a Taiwanese drama? Oh gosh. All my dramas are super old. Um, there was more than Meteor Garden, I swear to God. Um, <laughs> Because, yeah, Meteor Garden was the gateway okay. drug. That was awful. Um, <laughs> so so this is super that. old. Uh, sure. Okay. <laughs> well, it's the one that everyone was watching back then. It's old. But you can give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. What were they called? There was one called Mars, um, M -A -R which I loved. It was M-A-R-S. It was, it's also got one of the guys from meteor garden in it because that's the generation they're all in they weren't everything um <laughs> that one is a little bit heavier okay there's one called silence again a bit sad but heavy kind of gave me korean vibes Ooh. um but that was one of my favorites silence yes <laughs> so you'll kind of learn about f4 and you know the boy band that was of all boy bands at that time oh my gosh um, Wait, that's it's so hilarious. That, like, oh, this boy band was popular and like people got cast in. It's like the same person got cast in everything. <laughs> yeah. So they all four of them actually got cast into everything. Like it it was crazy. It was yeah, they were really, really popular. What are they um, up to now? Where are they now? Or did they just like I disappear? Don't know. Uh no. So at least one of them is still actively making music. Okay. I know because I have them on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, let's see. I don't know what the others are doing. I haven't actually had a look. Um, there are a couple of others that I can message you. Okay. That I can't remember the names of at the moment. But yeah. Okay. There, yeah, there was a period where I was really heavily into Crunchyroll and Taiwanese dramas. It was a bit nuts. <laughs> Wait. Oh, is that where you watch Taiwan? Oh my goodness. I didn't know that there was more than anime on Crunchyroll. <laughs> yeah, there was. there were dramas on Crunchyroll as well. Um, okay. I, I think they... I'm pretty sure they were, because I know I was watching some stuff on there for a bit. I could be wrong. Maybe I'm hallucinating, because um, <laughs> there was a lot of anime there too. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I should, what I'm hearing is that I should get a Crunchyroll account, because a lot of anime is on Netflix, <laughs> um, and just like other streaming services, so I've just kind of been piggybacking off that, but it sounds like I need to get like the dedicated anime streaming service. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't actually watched a lot of anime for the very longest time, uh -huh. um, but yeah, Crunchyroll had everything. Was <laughs> yeah. Cool. Wow, thanks for yeah. these recommendations. <laughs> Not a problem. So there's another A. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, yes! I forgot that that's how this conversation started. We're talking about Steam and now we're on <laughs> Um, dramas. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, we still got a few uh, soft questions. Do you have time? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Okay. So, what hobby interests do you have that is most unrelated to your field of work? I dabble in voice acting. Um, <gasps> I don't know if that's completely unrelated to my field of work because like, a lot of what I do is talk. Um, <laughs> I, I do voices, I guess. Um, I don't know if that counts as an A, but, um, I, it's just, I have fun with it. <laughs> That's cool. So what got you into voice acting? I, um, how, how did I get into it? I think I just like, I played a lot of video games and I was also very, um, I had a lot of stage fright at some point, um, yeah. and felt comfortable to be able to in a way like practice speaking in a way where I felt like people couldn't look at me um and it also felt comfortable to pretend to be someone else that wasn't me which is like kind of like embody a character where it's kind of like I don't have to feel embarrassed about this it's like I am yeah a person or like a different like character or whatever that's cool so what stuff have you been doing for your voice acting um it's mostly just a lot of like hobby stuff just like dubbing things for fun um oh cool voice clips to friends i guess like in fun voices <laughs> but uh i am trying to figure out like if this is something that i would want to explore monetizing i don't know <laughs> nice 
No, it's cool though. Like it's a really good way of being able to kind of work on that level of your confidence for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, for this kind of stuff, yeah, it's, it was hard. Like when I first put the first episode of this out, when I went to go hit the publish button, I was just swearing, just cursing, constantly oh, going, goodness. what am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, oh, wow. cause yeah, no media experience at all. And I keep hearing from other people that I need to take improv classes and that's going to help that's me. People keep to saying kind of to me build. as well. <gasps> yeah. So it's like, maybe I'm going to have to sign up for that improv class, see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's cool. All good skills. <laughs> and uh, which childhood book holds the strongest memories for you? Ooh, I, a book that I keep returning to is um, The Lightning Thief. Uh, it's not The Lightning Thief. Uh the thief lord um the thief lord yeah i i read i read the lightning thief but i'm thinking of um the thief lord by um cornelia funk i think is how you pronounce her surname um i have a copy of this book in my bedroom <laughs> in indonesia so every time i'm back i kind of reopen it and reread it and yeah. it kind of i feel like captures the spirit of just like being young and adventure i guess oh that's cool yeah that's cool i like that and what advice would you give someone who wants to do what you do and what advice should they ignore advice i would give i guess like um advice i feel like should be tailored to where the person in is in life um but yeah let's see <laughs> if i had to go back to me when i was graduating undergrad to figure out like how to be doing what I'm doing now, I would say like just start producing content. Um, I guess this is kind of related to like the fact that like you just went ahead and did this. It's kind of like you don't really need a ton of media experience. Like even if it's just like recording videos on your phone and uploading it to YouTube, it's like all you need is a smartphone and the rest of it is free. It's like it's that is something and it's like as you slowly build confidence and put, put things out there it's like the quality of the things that you create will definitely improve um and yeah. as you create this kind of stuff it creates a portfolio to like go show employers that it's like oh this is the thing that you know how to do it's like video edit editing ed editing is like something that like i just kind of like picked up on the side but now it's like a big part of my job um yeah yeah i cool. yeah just um just do it like bias towards action i guess is the thing that people say um yeah step out there um and it doesn't have to be perfect just do what sparks joy um and then it bad advice uh i think that a piece of advice i got a lot when i was starting my career was to go volunteer for things um, like mm -hmm. all the time. Um, and I understand where this advice comes from. It's kind of like, oh, if you go above and beyond and 150 to like go like do things for people, they will see that you are valuable and that will result in opportunities. And I feel like there are some places where that works really well. It's kind of like, like there, there are some environments where it's kind of like, oh, if you go above and beyond for a person, it's like that will come back and multiply and reward and it's like be good for you um but i feel i found out that there are some environments where if you go 150 people kind of expect that from you and that is now the baseline so it's like the fact that you're going above and beyond um they, doesn't get appreciated and it's like people don't respect your um boundaries or like the fact that just yeah. like and contributions yeah it's just kind of like oh they just kind of expect you to do that um and that just leads to i i i feel like i I see this advice given a lot to young women in tech. Um, so yeah. maybe, you know, or maybe it's like, this is just kind of like myopic because I am, at, I was at one point like a young woman in tech, but it's just like, I, it just makes you very sp spread very thin. Um, yeah. And that can sometimes make it difficult to argue a case for being promoted or just like showing that you are an expert in something. Cause you're doing like so many random miscellaneous things. Cause you've been like trying to volunteer in like a lot of different places. Yeah. Um, so, so that's my, that's like one piece of advice I wish I did not follow as much when I was starting off. Yeah. That, that's an interesting one. Cause I, I can absolutely see how, you know, say, you know, you stick your neck out and, you know, do stuff and people recognize what you can do, but yeah, there's got to have a balance for that. 
because depending on what it is that you're volunteering for, it's like, well, you're working for free. Yeah. Or you're going way above what you are required to do. And it's not just about being a team player. It's about, you know, being able to contribute at a level which is fair, not just like financially, but just in terms of the value of your time. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think, yeah, a lot, a lot of the time, I think we forget about valuing our own time and our boundaries yeah. when it comes to trying to get into spaces that we feel yeah. that we may not necessarily belong in. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 That's definitely a good consideration to have. I feel like one thing that I started, I, I wish I had started thinking about like years ago is like, um, figuring out like what energizes me. Um, and even if it's mm. like, even, even if I'm not in a position where I can like choose to exclusively do things that energize me, just like at least be aware of just like, what is the kind of stuff that like sparks joy for me where it's kind of like, oh, time disappears. And it's like, I could just do this forever um, versus like stuff that's just kind of like, oh my gosh, like this really drains me. Um, and I don't want to <laughs> do this. Definitely. Yeah. It, it's, it's tough. And yeah. I think a lot of us risk burnout because we're trying to figure this out and do everything at the same time. Mm-hmm. I yeah. am really excited to like ask myself this, I think like five years from now and just be like, oh, what is something that you kind of like, what's advice that you would give your, the version of me now? And yeah, I, I feel like I kind of want to like, just ask myself these questions like every year and track in a document and see how that evolves. Yeah, I, I, it's important. I mean, you got to reflect on what you're doing. And yeah, so it's a good way to check in with yourself, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, might do that myself. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much, Jessalyn, for speaking with me tonight. It's been absolutely fantastic, like talking to you about all this very cool stuff. <laughs> and yeah, getting all your perspectives on things and, you know, your very cool VR work like that's awesome. I love that, you know, that's what you've been, that, that was part of your journey and being able to, you know, work with the communities to, you know, be able to bridge that gap between, you know, I guess the developers and, you know, the bigger picture. And that's cool. So if people want to find out more about the kind of stuff that you do, where can they go? Ooh, um, I feel like the easiest way to find me is uh, Twitter. I am twitter.com nice. slash j t a n n a d y and if you can link that um in the description yeah. but cool yeah absolutely <laughs> very cool all right so thank you so much again jesslyn and yeah me. i hope you have yeah have hope you have an amazing evening okay bye hi i really enjoyed speaking with jesslyn about her work in augmented virtual reality her journey to develop advocacy and how that ties into the broader tech community and the democratization of tech It was also great to reflect on both of our backgrounds and how that impacted our respective STEAM journeys. To learn more about Justin and what we discuss in the show, or to connect with us, please visit the STEAM Powered website at steampoweredshow.com. You can also find out more about Justin on Twitter at jtanady. If you enjoyed this conversation, please let me know. Subscribe to this channel, leave a comment below, and share this with your geeky and geek curious friends. You can also support STEAM Powered on Patreon and Ko-fi under STEAM Powered Show, the links of which will also be in the show notes. Thanks for watching!